did the um oh we didn't second. do one last week i don't think so now okay. live Good evening and welcome to the Leo Gilling Show. It's a great Wednesday evening. Good afternoon, everybody out there in listener and viewer land. Welcome again to uh, another in the series of um, forums, virtual forums. We try to bring to you Jamaicans across the world um, uh, everything that we know about coronavirus. Uh, this evening, we have some special guests with us for this uh, healthcare professional series in the series. And um, right now I want, before we go any further, I want to recognize that we are on jamaicans.com on Facebook. Uh, we like, if you are on already joined us, please go ahead and share the show with anybody and everybody that you know, share it on your profile page, share it on any one of the pages or groups that you're on. We will do the same. And we have about an hour and a half long program for you this evening. And we are gonna have some fun and sharing some of these great information. Great, I said great information. <laughs> Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I wanna introduce to you the, uh, the host of the panel discussion, Dr. Beverly Gordon. Beverly. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. We're happy to be here this evening and we have a really wonderful panel lined up. Uh, we hope that as we talk about, not just about the, the, this, the disease, you know, COVID-19, everybody's anxious and nervous about what has happened and what will happen, but we want to look actually at some of the um, experiences of our frontline workers or healthcare professionals. And we're going to um, spend some time looking at how they're experiencing this COVID-19 and um, perhaps give some insight into how the um, other folks might be able to adjust and cope with all the ins and outs of the emotions that go along with it. So I'm going to start off by um, asking our panelists to introduce themselves. And tonight we have two ladies and two gentlemen, two nurses. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to do the traditional thing and go ladies first. I'm going to start off with um, Shannon Morgan. Shannon, could you please um, introduce yourself to our audience and just tell them a little bit about your professional identity. Okay, thank you so much. Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for having me. My name is Shannon Morgan, and I am from St. Catherine, Jamaica, and I've been in the the U.S. for uh, quite a while, um, but of course I keep the connection. So I am a nurse practitioner. I have a you know doctorate in nursing practice. I have a specialty in family medicine, and um, currently I am working in the home care setting. So I've been exposed to other areas, but right now this is where I am, providing care for patients inside their homes. Good, good. Thank you so much, Shannon, and I'll be coming back to you. Okay. Thank you. Right. So, um, Kamisha, Kamisha mm -hmm. Clark, could you please introduce yourself to the audience? Tell us a little bit about your professional identity. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is um, Kamisha Clark. I'm also a family nurse practitioner. I currently work in a hospital setting, um, seeing patients. I've been a nurse for 15 years. I've been living in New York for the last 20 years, and I've worked in different areas, med surge, the ER, home care, and now I'm in the hospital set and work on endocrine, um, glycemic um, service, treating mostly diabetes patients in the hospital. Great, thank you so much. All right, so now let's go to the gentleman. And gentlemen, you're just as important, you know, but, <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, so let me go to um, Dr. Gary Lawson. Can you tell uh, us a little bit about your professional identity? Thank you. Yes. Good night, everyone. My name is Gary Lawson. I'm a proud graduate of Jamaica College. I've lived outside of Jamaica since 1991. I'm a Naval officer, commander in the United States Navy, now reserves. I am also the president of my own anesthesia practice. Uh, we primarily do ambulatory and regional anesthesia. So we'll do anything from cradle to grave from neurosurgery to cardiac surgery, orthopedics, every and anything that we can take away from the hospital. So I'm sorry <laughs> to the nurses that I'm taking away <laughs> from you. Uh, I currently reside in Southwest Florida. Okay. 
All right, thank you so much. Um, and finally, um, last but not least, um, Dr. Garfield Clooney. Tell us about your professional identity. Thank you very much and good evening, everyone. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here and participate in the forum. Um, I am uh, originally from Jamaica. I was born in St. Anne's Bay, but we left when I was about three or four. So I uh, don't have much of an accent, but um, I grew up here in New York and Queens and uh, went to school here. Uh, I currently practice uh, maternal fetal medicine in New York City and maternal fetal medicine uh, deals with high risk pregnancies. So I take care of women who have uh, multiple issues from uh, diabetes, hypertension, multiple pregnancy loss, COVID, mm. all kinds of things. And so um, it's a very challenging job, but a very rewarding job. Um, and so happy to be here tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much. You see, we have a lineup of healthcare professionals in a variety of areas. And so we, we expect that we will hear um, interesting things from these folks. Um, I would like you to think for a moment, each of you, on a typical day, on a typical work day, what does it look, what did it used to look like for you before COVID? And has it changed or has it not changed? What impact has COVID had on your actual work day? And I'm gonna ask, um, I'm gonna go the other way this time. So I'm, I'm going to ask Dr. Clooney to talk on that first. Sure, thank you. Well, again, um, I do high risk obstetrics. And so obstetrics is, you know, the practice really of delivering babies and taking care of women. And so there's nothing better to me than doing that. Sorry, Mr. Anesthesiologist. But <laughs> <laughs> there's nothing, I mean, you can wake me up in the middle of the night to do that. That's a, that's a great thing. Uh, I've been fortunate enough to deliver as much as sex tuplets. So, you know, this is wow. great. Wow. Um, yeah, so, um, you know, going into work on a day-to-day -day basis is generally a happy occasion, going in to usher a woman and her family through the pregnancy, through, uh, through the delivery and, you know, having a great outcome. But of course there are challenges with pregnancy. Sometimes you don't have such a good outcome and there's some challenges that can occur. But in general, it usually is a good feeling, good outcome. And then came COVID. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, when COVID came, it's like, you know, there's a poem that starts out, you went to bed in one world and woke up in another. And it sort of felt that way because um, all of a sudden now everyone is wearing a mask. No one is touching each other. Everyone is distancing and no one really knows what's going on, how long this is going to take, how you get this thing, how you get rid of it, who's going to be affected. And so with that happy occasion of pregnancy, the hardest thing for me was that um, the hospitals really didn't allow visitors to come in besides other than the patients. And so a woman who would normally come in with her husband or her mother or some support person, now they were dropped at the door and said, go in and deliver your baby on your own. Oh my and God. so I, as well as the nurses were left with sort of the challenge of um, trying to normalize the situation as much for this patient and try to have her enjoy her pregnancy as much um, with all of us wearing all this paraphernalia of masks and gloves and the patient wearing masks and gloves. So it's a very fearful sort of situation, um, but you try to normalize as much as possible. And um, so I would say that um, COVID left us with a lot of questions. What do we do? How do we avoid this? How do we take care of the patients? How do we get through the day? But eventually we adapted, we you know got our guidelines together. And so we're, we're, we're sort of in the place where now we're sort of getting back to that sort of happiness or natural happiness with, with a pregnancy that comes in. But at the beginning, it was very difficult because of all the changes. So, so you're back to normal happiness? No, I wouldn't say we're back to normal, but oh. for instance, uh, the government has now allowed the husband to, he's mandated oh. that the husband can come in, even the patient can have a doula. And although we still have the mask and everything else, we kind of understand the disease a little bit better and how to avoid things. And when you really need to wear the mask or when you really need to wear the PPE, you know, things like that. And so we try to make it as, you know, as uh, normal, so to speak, for the patient as possible. Dr. Clooney, have you had any of your patients who actually had the um, COVID disease? Yes, yes. Oh. Yes, I've had several patients. And uh, as you'll see, there are gonna be lots of positive and the, the positive number is going to start to go up a lot because now most hospitals are testing every patient coming through the door. At mm -hmm. first we used to just test based on the symptoms of uh, you know cough, fever, shortness of breath and so on.
but now we're testing every patient coming through the door. And the thing that we found, which is really interesting, uh, many pregnant women are coming in completely asymptomatic and you test them and they're positive for COVID. Wow, and that wow. has a lot of ramifications for the delivery as well as for the postpartum period because you have to be separated from the baby and breastfeeding and all these things are become so, sort of slight challenges. Right. And so um, there are lots and we, we had uh, several patients uh, have to be intubated in the ICU and pregnant. And so there's a challenge of that because the physiology of pregnancy is not the same as a person who's not pregnant. So you have to work with the ICU doctors and try to get through that as well. Dr. Kunis, uh, were those patients diagnosed positive, anti or postnatal? Uh, prenatal. Prenatal, they're all prenatal, they're, they're all prenatal care. Yes. Now, mm -hmm. uh, I have been keeping up with the Jamaican news and there's uh, a sad story that I've been reading and I've been putting my two cents in with anyone who asked, because I was in gynecology, then I went to the dark side of anesthesia. <laughs> the dark side. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and one of the issues that they had was with this young lady who was 38 weeks pregnant and was denied care because right. people had this fear that right. she might be COVID positive. And I'm not sure if you are aware of what happened there, but like you said, the physiology of pregnancy is not usual with a normal pregnancy. And this young lady was a high risk pregnancy. Mm -hmm. She had an atrial septal defect. Right. Um, what would be your take to the Jamaican government or the people in the Jamaican Medical Association about how to look at pregnancies in light of COVID-19? Well, I'm, I'm gonna actually ask doc, Dr. Um, Clooney to think on that question for a okay. while. And I'm gonna come back to you with that, okay? Okay. okay. Good Thank question. You. Uh, that's an yeah, interesting. Question. That's an interesting topic you brought up there. Yeah. All right. So let me actually go to um, Kamisha, Kamisha Clark, Doctor Kamisha Clark. Actually, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, can you tell us? Um, can you tell us what your typical day looked like before COVID? Uh, so my typical day is similar to Doctor Clooney's, and <laughs> more happier day going to work. <laughs> Looking forward to go to work. So I work in a hospital setting and um, typical day, it's a nine to five job, Monday through Friday, and it's uh, five days a week, uh, eight hour shift. And generally in the morning, happy, you go see your patient, regardless where they are, whether it's in the ICU setting, mother and baby, L&D, labor and delivery, like where Dr. Clooney is talking, also talking about. So wherever the patients are, that would be a typical day. Mm -hmm. um, since COVID has happened, 90% um, of my caseload of maybe say, for example, 30, 25 to 30 patients, 95% are COVID patients. Oh. Initially, when we started seeing patients, initially when we started seeing patients, there was a fear, you know, yes, there was PPE, but how do we go in? How do we mass up, you know, anxiety? Should I go in? Should I not? Can we work remotely? All these factors go, uh, started um, was one of the things that was in play. Um, uh, since lately, even today, the case of 95% of the patients that are COVID are now 40%. So it has decreased. We have seen a turnaround where we are in terms of the hospital setting. I know they were pulling a lot of uh, providers, including patient people from the PAs, surgery, um, in different settings to work in the COVID unit. Um, I was hoping, some anticipation that I won't be pulled. Thank God my service was so busy enough um, with diabetes endocrine that I stayed on my service. I didn't, but people were pulled because we weren't doing surgery for a while. Mm -hmm. So we had PAs, surgery residents, NPs that were pulled into work in the COVID unit. Yes, I'm still seeing patients. I have been seeing patients that has COVID, but not full time. Mm -hmm. These other providers were in the COVID unit for the whole shift. So huh, that must have created quite a bit of um, an <laughs> And she has, a, I think you have, you have a young, a young daughter. Uh, 11, 11. And, Imagine that. And uh, then yeah. coming home, that's coming the, home. also the other factor in terms of after you finish working, then you have to come home and then you're trying to isolate yourself from your family, you know, not wanting to shoot, you, you're not sure, you don't want to pass the virus on to anybody else. And when this started, nobody knew, you know. So you, so so. you wore, you wore stuff all the way home that you can, 
shed when you get to the door, right? How, how uh, the scrub look? is at the door. <laughs> <laughs> the change of scrubs at the door, have a bag, everything, put everything in a bag, <laughs> took a shower, the whole uh, deal before coming in. Yeah, uh, when you come okay. in, take a shower right away, you know, have a routine. Still okay. do. <laughs> a whole different, a whole different. Um, Stop wearing clothes to work. Now it's just scrubs, just oh, scrubs. <laughs> gosh. Right. I'm gonna come back. I'm gonna come back to you in terms of some of the emotions okay. that were generated because of this anxiety. Okay. okay. Cool. All right. But let me go to um uh, Dr. Lawson. Oh my God! I forgot to go ahead. What's that? Oh, uh, Dr. Lawson, how about um, how about your regular day? What, what what did it look like before COVID, and how has it changed if it has? I am I'm one of those persons who would go like, thank heaven for COVID. My life. <laughs> what? <laughs> oh, no, that's a statement. <laughs> okay, I'm going to clarify that, right? Uh, see, yes, please. <laughs> my, my, my thing is, I've had what would be called a dysfunctional routine. We have eight offices. And as president, I travel between all eight offices. We every have, day? It's not every day. We, okay. we're, we're spread out uh, a total of about 100 miles separate the farthest offices. And I will start my days at 0500, drive to the farthest one it needs to go to. We see, we have about 30 staff. We cover a thousand patients mm -hmm. a month. And I'm there managing that aspect, the administrative, clinical, and then having to come home. I have two kids, you saw them earlier, take my daughter four days a week. She has swim treat training for an hour and a half in the evenings, make sure I've done that, make sure that they're fed, make sure the homework is done. And my wife lives 1300 miles away, You've got a plan for whichever weekends you're going to fly to take them to go see there. So it was very hectic. And like Dr. Clark said, you know, having a child and having things disrupting your pattern, that very hard. And when the government, well, at least the president gave an executive order, he recalled all the military that included myself. I had to now put other things in play because their mom is away. She works in Chicago. She's an anesthesiology resident. So there would be no one to take care of the kids and take care of that pattern. So fortunately for COVID, they canceled all the swim meetings. Schools were closed. Oh, that's <laughs> what you meant. <laughs> <laughs> and, and right now, with work, we are down to 10% patient caseload. So that has given me ample time to wake with them, go to bed with them, enjoy some of the things that others may not like. I mean, I've heard many parents complaining, but me, I am realizing what benefit this is that I'm getting to recap some things which I was missing out on going to work so early, spending long hours, and I'm catching up on it, and I'm giving thanks for that. Mm -hmm. I got to see a silver lining in, in something. So most of your, most of your um, change is, is with family, not it's with work, with family. Job. Well, okay. the job is we're down to 10% of our workload. Right. Uh, I make sure all my staff get to work in lieu of myself. I'm yes. the president of one day. <laughs> Call the shots. <laughs> <laughs> but it's beneficial for them because at least they get a salary. But it's more important that I am living the, the, the opportunity I get right now is be with my kids. And sometimes it could be annoying, but I, I count the blessings just learning from them and seeing the things. And when I look at the things that other parents don't have that, they have to be on the front line all the time. My wife works 24 seven. Mm. She is there exposing herself. We don't go see her now because we have travel restrictions. And so we miss out on that, but the power of technology, Zoom, FaceTime, uh, we're, we're, we're still able to, to have family time that way. So, so it's, a, it's a mixed bag, really? It's a mixed bag, yes. I could say, oh, we're, we've lost a lot of money. We've lost a lot of patient contact, but I am getting something that there's, you can't put a dollar amount on. I learned that when I first was deployed to Iraq, what family can mean. And now I'm getting another chance of appreciating in family. So yeah. yes, I, I'm happy. It's selfish. I am sad what is happening to the nation and to others who are in a you know, worse situation than us. But 
in Spanish, no hay mal de que bien no venga. There's no bad from which you don't find good. Yeah. So you just can't help recognizing the blessings. Even that there are blessings so in yes. pain. And of course, you're not, you're not endorsing the, the negative things that are happening to nope. people. But you, nope. you are counting your blessings and giving thanks. <laughs> yes. 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 And you know, that's a really interesting aspect to this. Because a lot of times when something bad like this is happening, we tend to focus only on the negative effects. But in fact, we can always find something positive for which to give thanks. Give thanks. Thank you so much for that. Yeah. Okay, and let me move on then to um, Shannon. Hi. <laughs> um, Shannon Morgan, Dr. Shannon Morgan. Tell us about your typical day and how it has changed. So my typical day in home care, it would be 100% on the road, five days a week, from 8.30 to 5 p.m., I'm on the road. I'm going to patients' homes, home after home after home. Um, for the weeks that I'm on call, you know, I prepare myself. If I get an urgent call, I'm out and I'm on the road. Mm -hmm. Since COVID, we have made a lot of changes. We have modified to doing a lot of telemedicine. Mm. So we quickly transitioned from face-to-face -face contact to um, either telephone or televideo. Um, cases. So a lot of patients, you have to understand that with COVID, they're also fearful. So they are fearful for us to come into their homes. They do understand that we're going, we're on the road all the time. We're going between houses. So they also have their own concerns. Mm -hmm. So we find that patients are hesitant to accept in-person visit, you know, because of their fears. And when we give them the option say, hey, listen, we can do this by the phone or by video, they are more receptive. You okay. know, so we are using that level of technology more now because of COVID. Mm -hmm. So we've, we've moved. If the plan was always in place to, to go that route. But since COVID, we have really accelerated getting to that point. Mm -hmm. So for myself, I've really been working from home for the past few weeks. It has been great. <laughs> you know, I definitely am enjoying that. And, um, you know, we do have some of my colleagues who have gone out to see a few patients here and there. Now, starting tomorrow, I am back on the road going out to see patients. And really, you know, we are going in in full gear. And I know that may be scary for some patients. I've actually had colleagues who, you know, the patient accept the in-person visit, the colleague shows up and she's in full gear. And full gear means we are gowning up, we're masking up, we're gloving up. And, you know, they panic and, you know, they say, okay, no, but a lot of patients, you know, are comfortable with the video visits. A few of them are okay with having us in person um, concerning COVID. Um, what we also notice is that we are getting a lot of calls because patients are fearful. They want to know if they have it. We also have a lot of situations where you know, patients have family members who have contracted the virus and have been hospitalized and have also even passed away from it. Um, for my own panel, uh, and I carry a panel of about 100 patients, and so far I've lost about seven of them. And I will tell to, you that- To COVID? To COVID, yes, to COVID, about seven of them. And I will tell you that my panel was the least hit, the least. I have colleagues who have a panel of 250 patients and have lost literally 10% of their panel to COVID. Wow. You know, and it, it, it is scary for the family. It's scary for the patients. So even though we're not going in face to face as much, we are there for them. Mm -hmm. We have a 24 hour availability kind of service. So if they call us 24 seven, someone will be there. I'm actually on call tonight for the next seven days, back to back. And right before I got on, I was dealing with two cases. So patients have a lot of fear and having, you know, like healthcare professionals being there for them. Sometimes it's just to talk, you know, it, it helps reassure them, it helps calm them. You know, it helps guide them, not just medically, but provide some level of outlet, you know, and some level of mental peace and mental calmness that is really needed. So, you know, my work has changed, but I see a lot of good being done. You know, we're reaching out to patients and touching them more than just the clinical, yeah. you know? Yeah. So we're utilizing more of that in, in what we do. 
Thank God for technology. Thank God. Yes. Yes. Beverly. Yes, Leo. Dr. Beverly. I, I, I want to bring out this to, to, um, to Dr. Clooney and Clark. Right? Mm -hmm. So back in March, um, I was watching the numbers almost every day with New York going crazy, right? And when they got to 2,000 a day dying, I said, Jesus, space, mm. you know? And, and it jumped from 2,000 to like 4,000 within one day. And I wanted to go to the supermarket. So I stepped outside my door. And when I stepped outside of my door, a piece of breeze licked me, right? Yeah. I said to myself, say, well, I better order from the supermarket. <laughs> because because we, at that time, we didn't know how you catch COVID or that it's true. Because they were talking eight feet, 10 feet, you know, airborne, all kind of stuff. So that was a fear that came over me that day. I'm saying, I'll come with the most. Mm -hmm. My question to especially Clooney and Clark is when you walk up or walked up to your door, your, your, your office door or your, 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 the, the ward door or whatever, uh -huh. to see a patient, what goes through <clears throat> your mind? I think for me, the first thing, as I said, when it started back in March, when the first case that I had or one or two cases, I'm like, I don't need to go in that room. I'm not going in that room. <laughs> yeah, because there's a sense of fear and anxiety. Some of the same thing that Morgan is talking about that, you know, some of the things that patients feel, people forget that we're also human. You know, we are healthcare providers, <laughs> but we still have a slew of different feelings that we go through, whether it's fear, it's anxiety, you want to help. This is, you know, this is what we were, we, we came to this profession to do, but it doesn't take away from the fact that sometimes we may have these things. And one of the instances um, in some of the rooms that, uh, that had COVID patient, they had a glass door or, or the, the transparent glass that you can actually see the patient. Initially, when we started, uh, it gave us the permission to actually, we can call the patient, especially if they have a phone or there's a phone in a room that we could, instead of going in to see them, especially I'm from endocrine glycemic service. So we're not primary. Um, we're consulting on the case, certain questions that we needed. Um, we call the patient and have that conversation with them. So initially when it started out, just one or two cases, those were some of the ways that we started doing it. Um, and then as the case started increasing more and more, <laughs> it's hard <laughs> not to see, you know, these patients anymore. Um, they start getting, we, we were trained in terms of the PPE supplied with the N95 and, you know, uh, give us, gave instruction of how to go in and, you know, you just put it on, say a prayer. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm serious, you know, seriously. And then tell yourself you're here to help just like how we are fearful patients that are in the room are also fearful you know themselves they're going through their own emotion imagine we're touching something that people value mm -hmm. and now because of this it, it's something that's it's a taboo now it's like you don't do and a patient is in a room you know in a closed room closed off room from other people that they're not having the in and out interaction has now been limited imagine how they feel so at the same time you brave up yourself and you tell yourself we're here to do our best and we go in with a straight face and be happy and provide compassion because at the end of the day yes we provide care and all of that patients are still looking for that compassion that we i think we were called to this profession to do and i think in this time we're seeing that more and more so initially when i started out there was hesitation going in. Now it's like, okay, they have it, suit up, follow the pro protocol and move forward to the next one. Yeah, that is actually that is actually a question that I'd like to ask each one of the panelists. Oh, okay, okay. In, in terms of in terms of your emotions, your emotional re response <laughs> to all of this, you know, um, just just as um you were discussing just now, um, Kamisha, with the idea that. Yes, the patients have feelings, they have mm -hmm. thoughts, they have fears, but so do I. But mm -hmm. I've got to put mine aside and actually 
take care of you. How, how was that for the, for the rest of you, others of you, mm. anybody? Well, I will tell you. Say, go ahead, Sean. Go ahead. Okay, no, <laughs> thank first. you. Thank you. I would just say like initially, I will tell you initially because I understood the nature of the work that I do and moving about. I, I made a decision, which it was very difficult. Um, I have a three-year-old, he just turned three, and I made the decision to let him be in Florida. He's with family. And I did that because I had concerns. I had concerns, you know, going out there because at that point, we did not yet stop the inpatient visit, the in-person visit. We were still doing them. Mm -hmm. And I was concerned of possibly picking up the virus and then bringing it home to him. Mm -hmm. So even though there were these reports initially that stated that it more than likely affect like the elderly population and so forth, I did not want to take that risk. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I had that real fear. So I made that decision. You know, in terms of myself, it, it, I am concerned. It is a real fear. Um, but you learn to put it aside when you're dealing with the patients. I've done that. But in terms of getting an outlet, it is you know, having conversations with my colleagues, whether we work at mm -hmm. the same place or at other locations, you know, to hear their stories, you know, what they've been experiencing, having gratitude for the place where I am in the fact that, you know, temporarily I was not being exposed in that sense, even though it starts tomorrow. <laughs> but at the same time, really being a, <laughs> right, thank you. But at the same time, you know, like having conversation, being there for them you know, like when they're having very difficult days and telling me of all the things that they've gone through. Um, it's, it's a lot, but I, I, I feel grateful that I'm in a position that I'm able to provide support to them. And in having that conversation, it gives me calm. It, it gives me calm. And, you know, family members do reach out to me because they know the kind of na the nature of the work that I do. You know, they call on me, they check on me, they, just to see how I'm doing, you know? you know, if I'm out there as yet, and you know, that they are praying for me, you know, you're going to be safe, just practice, practice the methods that you need to once you go back out there. Mm -hmm. And it helps because as healthcare workers, we're natural givers, right? Mm -hmm. And we're, we're naturally, you know, being compassionate to everybody else, and being considerate and hearing everybody else's feelings. And sometimes we forget ourselves. And, mm -hmm. you know, that's not healthy. So finding ways to just getting support, you know, not just giving it, but just getting support, whether it's from family, whether it's from, you know, other colleagues. And I will tell you too, even when I'm calling to check up on the patients, they're checking up on me, mm -hmm. <laughs> asking, how are you? Are you doing well? Is your family doing well? And believe me, as much as when you do that for patients, it makes them feel so good. It's the same with us, mm -hmm. right? when others check on us and um, wanting to make sure that we are also doing okay and that we are also taking care of ourselves, you know, it gives us that level of comfort that we all need as humans. And, and as you said that, that we all need as humans, I was thinking it's a common human element, you know, no matter what your job title or your place of origin, whatever, we're all human beings and we have some basic human needs that need to be met, especially in these times of crisis. Absolutely, absolutely. Dr. Lawson, I was thinking that in, in talking about this, it, it sounds like an act of courage to actually go to work. And I was <laughs> wondering, I was wondering if you see any similarity between this situation and you mentioned that you were in Iraq, for example, and you know, just being in the service, do you see any similarities here? In, in my case, again, I'm gonna be that guy who's on the other side of the curve because I live through MERS, I live through SARS, I live through H1N1. Mm -hmm. I am old enough to have remembered when HIV started and I was a volunteer with the Jamaica Red Cross mm -hmm. as a teenager. So I know there are certain things that you do to protect yourself. As the owner of a business, I put on my military hat and became manager. So I had to put things in place long before the US government decided to put things in place. I was traveling overseas to see my in-laws when I noticed what was happening coming from January. So we started things. We weren't gonna wait for the government to tell us what to do. Because again, I remembered SARS. Mm -hmm. I remembered H1N1. I was infected with H1N1. I remember MERS. So I learned from experiences elsewhere. 
we put things in place. I wasn't worried about me getting an infection. I was more worried about my staff and their families. So the similarities between being Iraqis, again, being an officer there and worrying more about my people getting hurt and making sure the mission got complete, but you make sure you did everything that was necessary to protect them all, not worrying about myself personally. And to this day, again, I, I might just be young and dumb or old and dumb. I don't show what it is. I just- Middle-aged and dumb? <laughs> okay. Middle-aged and dumb. <laughs> but I'm more worried about my wife who yeah. is 1,300 miles bad. away. She's doing her job. And maybe she doesn't have the better angels as I do that's telling me, don't think about it. Just keep on doing your job. So I have the manager's cap on. And that's, that's, all, that's what I have been doing, the manager's cap. OK. What about you, Dr. Clooney? Yeah, I'm going to say, just in brief, uh, I remember the first uh, COVID patient that I had to go in and see. And I shouldn't say really have to go and see, but I, I, I went in to see. Um, she was a patient that was in preterm labor, and I had to go in and evaluate her. And um, the PPE were outside the room, and I put everything on. <clears throat> and actually, when I was going through the room, I, I like um, my anesthesia friend here, I didn't feel so fearful for myself because I'm used to wearing PPE for different reasons. Mm -hmm. There are patients that are on isolation for different reasons. So it wasn't so foreign to me, although COVID was a sort of a different level. It wasn't so foreign. But I remember going into the room and actually apologizing to the patient for the way I was dressed because I felt like a monster, really. And I felt like, mm. you know, she was a very young girl. And, and I just I, and I said, I apologize that I have all this on, but it's for protection for you and me, you know, because of the situation that's going on. You know, so you, you do have that nurturing way of, you know, you, no matter what the challenge is or what the obstacle is, you still want to protect the patient and make them feel comfortable as possible throughout, you know, throughout the situation. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a matter of, this is something that I think is common for healthcare workers. We tend to, um, because of the field that we've chosen, it means that we really care about people. Mm -hmm. And so I still think it's an act of courage because you know, courage is not, has been said, courage is not the absence of fear, but it's the ability to function in spite of the fear. And I think that's what we do a lot of times because if we, we tend to know a lot about the cases and, the, and, the, and the, um, the, the diseases that we're dealing with and we know the possibilities, but at some point you kind of do put that aside and just go forward and do what you need to do. Yeah. And I, I really just want to, at this point, just say thank you to all the individuals who are out there on the, on the front line, giving of themselves to take care of others, even at the great risk to themselves. So I really want to say a direct thank you to those of you who are on the panel and anyone who might be watching who happens to be um, healthcare workers, because the work that you're doing is not easy. And it's not something that everybody would choose to do, but you're doing it and it needs to be done. So thank you very I, much. <laughs> I want to ask a question, if you don't mind. No, go um, ahead. Uh, Dr. Clooney uh -oh. happens to have been a victim of mm -hmm. COVID-19. And so I wanted, I, I wanted him to tell us a little bit from the first time he felt the first touch, mm -hmm. what was it? And you know, how did you uh, recover? You know, what did you do? Yeah, uh, thanks. It, it unfolded in an interesting way to me. Um, I remember I started with a very mild cough, <clears throat> just a something in my throat, just a little bit of cough. And you know, it's it's the winter time. You know, you don't know what, you know what it is. And I it, I didn't feel you know it, it was anything in particular. And then about forty eight hours after that cough came, I started to have the fevers. And then I realized this is something else. Um, <laughs> and so um, I had the cough and the fever. I took Tylenol, brought it down. I went to urgent care the next day because I didn't want to go into work. And they actually sent me home. They said, well, you know, you probably have a cold. It doesn't sound like you have COVID. We shouldn't test you. But this was earlier on when everyone was trying to figure out what to do, who to test, and who was really at risk, and so on. And so I did stay home that day. And, and I remember over the next few days, I still had the fever and a couple of symptoms I had that they've changed a lot or they've added a lot since we've started. But um, one thing was that I lost my sense of taste and smell, which was the most bizarre thing ever. And uh, my clothes felt like sandpaper on me. Like I couldn't wear, it, it was just very uncomfortable to wear clothing. And that when I felt that, I realized that something is really wrong with me at this point. Um, and so I uh, 
because I did, I wasn't instructed to stay home. I actually went back to work. And at that time we were not instructed to wear masks all day long. So I was probably oh, walking no. to work, probably maybe, you know, being wow. a victim to others, but um, a couple of days into it, I started to have some shortness of breath. I started to, I couldn't take a deep breath without coughing. I couldn't say a sentence to my patient. You know, your ultrasound looks normal. Your baby's moving without coughing or gasping for air. And so I went back to urgent care and finally they did test me and said it was positive. And the, the interesting thing I find though about this COVID monster is that it affects everyone in such different ways. Mm -hmm. And me, for instance, I sort of was heading from the cough to the fever, to the can't smell, to the breathing issues. And then when I stayed home, all I did really was all the Jamaican home remedies that I've heard. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the garlic, the garlic, and the lemon peel, and this, and yeah. sniffing it, and you know, tea with lemon, and all, all right. items, I, I thought, all those I things. thought you're a doctor. I thought you're a doctor. You're supposed <laughs> to call the pharmacy, right? <laughs> <laughs> all those remedies, and you know, thank, and a lot of praying, of course. And thank God, you know, day by day, I just kind of got better. No, no antibiotics, no medication, no nothing. Mm -hmm. And so it's it's very bizarre to me to think about this this um, COVID actually taking people's lives. And what, sometimes I'd say, you know, why was I spared? What, what was the reason why, you know, how, mm -hmm. I mean, it's, you know, managed to get away from it. But, um, but yeah, the, the uh, moral of the story though, is that, you know, there is life at the end of the tunnel. And if you do get COVID, it's not a sentence where, you know, you're really doomed and, and things like that you don't necessarily have to end up on a ventilator. You know, but you do need to boost your immune system. I would say that. Um, to be, mm. well, we may have a chance later on to talk about some things that can help do that. You know, Dr. Kunis, the things you had are the symptoms that in the Western world, many people were not paying attention to, whereas in Asia, we all knew it. There, were, there was Hong Kong, Thailand, there are all the studies that have shown it, but you had the classic your dermatologic symptoms here, sandpaper on your skin. Yeah. Loss of yeah, yeah. loss of smell. Mm -hmm. Many people have diarrhea, and mm -hmm. they're oh no, that's mm -hmm. not it. And we're not testing, and mm -hmm. they're shedding virus everywhere. Lower, right? You had what we call classic, classic, but here they want you to be in respiratory mm -hmm. distress. Yeah. And one of the things that we'll find out is there are patients who are in fulminant respiratory failure, but do not look like it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they're walking around and they're mm -hmm. passing things on to their families. And they crash very quickly. And then they crash yeah. afterwards. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Go ahead. I, I, wanted, I wanted to kind of just go back briefly um, to a question that Dr. Lawson had posed to um, Dr. Clooney about the physio physiological changes or differences during pregnancy mm -hmm. and how that might um, affect even as we're talking about how some people present with different um, symptoms, um, you know, what, what about the physiological changes during pregnancy that might actually confuse the issue in terms right. of diagnosing? Right, so I think one of the main things is that your lung capacity changes because of the, um, the, the pregnancy sort of a space occupying mm -hmm. lesion really, mm -hmm. and it pushes everything up towards your lungs. So it's not unusual for a pregnant woman to have some shortness of breath. Mm -hmm. um, but you have to really pay attention to it um, and you have to really check the O2 sacs because um, uh, many people can tolerate O2 sacs maybe closer to the lower 90s, but pregnant women, once you go to 95, then that O2 saturation starts to affect the fetus's uh, pH balance. And so you have to be very careful uh, with those kinds of things. Also, um, uh, pregnancy is an immunocompromised state just from the beginning because 50% of the fetus is foreign. And so the body already, the immune system is dampened. And so you really have to pay attention to any symptoms that any pregnant women have. Um, pneumonia is very, um, very common, especially for um, the winter time, especially um, for pregnant women, very, very common. So if, if, um, if, a, pregnant if a pregnant woman um, had um, upper respiratory symptoms, mm -hmm. of, outside of COVID, say there's no COVID, we don't know anything about COVID at the moment, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. a pregnant woman had um, respiratory, upper respiratory symptoms. Um, say, for example, she had a history of asthma, mm -hmm. right? And um, so during the pregnancy, you know, she, she, she develops, you know, shortness of breath and all of that. What are some of the um, differential diagnosing issues that would arise with this? 
Right. Well, you can't forget that she could have, you know, a common cold. <clears throat> she could have influenza, you know, um, or some other type of viral, viral um, pneumonia or some other viral illness. So um, you have to look at the entire picture. Um, and, you know, there are people that come up with that have what we call walking pneumonia. And so you have to really evaluate all those things. We're very focused on COVID. And I try to tell the residents this, that um, although you're testing someone for COVID, remember influenza has very similar symptoms. So you should really be including, including influenza in there and getting that chest x-ray as well to, to make sure that things are okay. All right, thank you for that. Um, we want to go on to talk about, to talk about um, we've talked about some of the emotions that you have experienced as um, healthcare workers. Um, what have you done in terms of self-care, specific interventions that you've taken um, in terms of self-care? I know for myself, uh, I'll talk. <laughs> um, I know my director at work came up with this motiva motivational speaking in the morning and um, a few of us come together, we call and we pray you know, and give some motivational talk or something. That's something we have done. I know with the Jamaica Nurses Group the, um, here in New York, we have our meeting and we get a forum to also vent. Um, I know uh, for family, connecting with family, we have this download this app, House Party. And we, as a family, we go on and we play a game and we just talk and just to get away from this. Uh, for me, I do not binge watch the news. Because just that negativity at work and then after work, mm -hmm. after working eight hours, five days a week and then come home again and you hear the news and it doesn't end. For me, I keep away, you know, I listen, still be aware of what's also going on. But at the same time, um, do not binge watch on the news and try to find something that is not COVID related. Talk to friends, family. And I think Miss um, Morgan talked about this before, just talking to colleagues you know, family and friends, you know, it helps. Talking to somebody, getting their thoughts out, it kind of helps. I know at work, they also provide opportunities for counseling for some of us who are working on a unit, we're exposed at this and we all cope differently. There's a hotline that we can also call. Today, the psychiatrist came to our department just to talk to us, just to say, how are you doing? And, you know, provide some information to say if we need help. It's and it's available for us also. Good. Anyone else? Uh, as Kamisha said, get rid of the news. <laughs> there is there's no 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 need yeah. to get on it. You'll either get contrasting things, which you know medically does just doesn't right. make sense, and the empty barrels make the most noise. So that's what's going to be there. For me, I clean, I reorganize, I teach, and exercise. <laughs> and when I say yeah. cleaning, I literally mean I'll clean the same thing multiple times. It's just hard for <laughs> my day. When we're in the OCD. Navy. It's not OCD, right? It's not OCD. <laughs> <laughs> you're right, you're right. <laughs> any, any of you have ever been in the military or been on a ship, you know, eight bells every morning, mm -hmm. it's cleaning station, and you'll clean the same spot with the same oh, rag, oh, do the same thing. <laughs> and I've found, I used to think it was silly, but I've found I've gone and I have reorganized the same set of paper. Yesterday, yeah. they were just off. Now today, they make sense being in this folder instead. You know, going in my computer, finding old records of things and organizing. Dr. Clooney will get this. You, you wrote notes years ago or things you were thinking of teaching. And now you go, oh, now I can update different things. And you just change those files in your PowerPoint. Uh, looking at memorabilia, especially of um, my daughter when she was younger and just putting them. And I found that that keeps me well grounded. And social media, here's a shout out to TikTok. My daughter likes <laughs> to make videos. So I'll just sit there and watch her do her dances, <laughs> kids, and, and try to follow her. And that forms part of my exercise pattern. Or I have them running around on their scooters. And whilst they're doing that with my weights, just as long as they can play, I can lift my weights. Mm. And okay. those, those things um, yeah. help, help me stay grounded. Because I said, the news <clears throat> is depressing. Yes. Yeah. When the leaders are giving contrasting information. Mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. And talk, talking about that, what, what um, 
uh, maybe maybe I'll direct this to you, um, Dr. Lawson. What about some of the um, conspiracy theor theories that are floating mm -hmm. around? Well, the thing is, conspiracies are conspiracies. It's right. when the theory gets attached to it that makes yes. it false. Yes. And as a, um, again, my services in the military, we know certain things that have happened. The, the mm. conspiracy theory is that, well, the Chinese made this and they hooked it up to 5G <laughs> technology and things like that. You know, I have yeah. spent weeks actually talking to my colleagues who are professionals in Jamaica saying, listen, guys, that's, that's just not, not there. Okay? <laughs> it's, 5G is just a means of seeing <laughs> pictures faster. And kids have been using 5G on their Xboxes and their exactly. games for years, and no one was the wiser. Yeah. Uh, so it, it's not there. In terms of um, that it was created purposely, well, no one can say yeah or nay. But when they're bashing the wet markets and saying, well, wet markets are to be blamed, most people don't understand that wet market is a term in Asia we use for any market where everything is fresh. If you want your vegetables, it's going to be a wet market because there's water there to keep everything fresh, not spraying chemicals on them to look glistening and nice. If you want your seafood, it's going to be in a tank with water. So this ubiquitous term of a wet market and they're the cause of all the world's ills, um, it's, it's narrow-minded or uneducated for people to be throwing that out there. Mm -hmm. It's like somebody coming to Jamaica and complain if they go to the coronation market and go, oh my God, these people are unhygienic. Mm -hmm. They have foods on the ground. Uh, they have ground HIV. Stuff. <laughs> yes, and we're the ones that propagate. So uh, it, that's short-sighted and um, we shouldn't give much credence to any of those things. Gary wanted to say something. No, no, I mean, no, no. the other Gary. Dr. 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 Clooney? No, no, I was just uh, agreeing with everything you're saying because I get, uh, I have to say, I've gotten probably about 25 emails, uh, 75 videos rather, about the 5G. People are sold on this 5G connection to this COVID. <laughs> but I try to tell them, remember, this is, this is um, people are dying, you know, from COVID and yeah. take the precaution seriously, you know, leave the uh, conspiracy, conspiracy theories aside. Because for one thing, there's nothing you can really do about it, right? You can't change, if, if that is the case, there's nothing you can change about that. And I also tell people, I'm not particularly religious, but I said, maybe this is the time for you to just sit quietly and meditate or, you know, something like that, you know, uh, instead of focusing on some conspiracy theories. So, you know, um, fear and anxiety are two of the major emotions that people are experiencing during this time. And I, I was thinking that if you add, if you add um, ignorance, and I'm using ignorance in, in, the, in the strict sense of not knowing, um, so if you add ignorance to fear and anxiety, you can really get um, a dangerous situation. Mm -hmm. um, recently, the, the, some of the states, most of the states at this point are beginning to reopen as they use the term. And what, what, what we've been hearing is that um, individuals, you know, have started acting in very mm -hmm. aggressive, hostile ways um, to, the, to, to the extent as a matter of fact that one person was shot as, as a result of encouraging mm -hmm. other people to follow the guidelines. Some, another a park ranger was pushed into a creek um, because he asked them to maintain social distancing. Um, what can we as healthcare workers, any ideas of what we can do to um, help to alleviate some of this panic that, that individuals are moving into. As we, as we know, we've gotten settled in with COVID and we got used to all the restrictions and what have you. And now there's this controversy. We can reopen, no, we can't reopen. We shouldn't reopen, yes, we should reopen. Some are reopening, some are not. And then people are, are panicking because of the um, economic situation and all of that. What can we do as healthcare workers to help individuals to maintain both their physical and their mental health at this time? Well, the first thing we need to do as physicians, as a nurse practitioner, we are the tip of the spear when it comes to taking care of people. We have to be above the political fray. See, I, I have in one of my centers, 30 different surgeons, and I have several of them at any day. Whilst I've had my patients sign paperwork, they're saying their surgeries are urgent 
and needed to be done on this particular day, otherwise there'll be threat to life or limb. Mm -hmm. I've had surgeons who behind my back is telling the patients, this is unnecessary. This is a political ploy. It is all meant to destroy a certain political leader. And we need to be above that fray. And when these questions are posed to us, we just need to say, listen, for your well-being and that of society, we must do the following things. And when I say that for society, like it or not, the Western, so-called Western world, we are all about individualism. <laughs> I've had the fortune of living in Japan for several years and South Korea and in Thailand. The collective, the good of the group mm -hmm. supersedes that of the individual. You know, they, the old saying, America sneezes, Jamaica catches a cold. Well, we are behaving more and more like the Americans, the rugged individualist that wants to do things for themselves. And that is where we're gonna be having most of our problems. So by addressing the individual and saying, listen, your well-being is okay the way you want to do something, but remember the good of the country. Mm -hmm. Yes, economically, you may feel you're suffering. Do you know how bad it's gonna be when there's nobody to pay taxes later because they're all dead? Right. But the um, here and now, I, they need to know that they, they, they are part of being the good guys. By just protecting themselves from us and us from them, we will get through that. Dr. Morgan is, is muted. I don't think she knows. Oh, there she is. Yeah, yes. So I, I, I absolutely agree with what was just stated. Um, you know, in having conversations, even with my neighbors, because I, <laughs> I did spot a few of them outside without their mask. Mm. And I, I did take a few minutes to just explain to them. I said, listen, there may be a lot of conflict and in information that you're hearing. But I said, think about it this way, right? We know that it's happening. We know it's affecting people. We know that there are some people who are dying from it. I said, we also know that there are carriers who are not showing any symptoms at all. So the best thing for you to do is to wear the mask, right? Because just think of it this way. Maybe you're talking to somebody else and they're carrying it and they could pass it on to you. They're just not showing symptoms. So to protect yourself, you wear the mask, right? And then for the other person who you're having conversation with, you encourage them to do the same. So while we're not all outside wearing N95s, if we're just wearing the regular surgical mask or the cloth made mask, if everybody's wearing it, then there's less being spewed out in the atmosphere, right? There's less droplets going around. So there's less likelihood of contracting something if, you know, somebody has it. Mm -hmm. So I just give it to them in that perspective so that they understand that you're not going to be able to tell everybody who have this thing, right? Mm -hmm. We had a story before where, you know, there was a, the virus was, was there, but what, you went to the urgent care, they said, no, go home, you go back and you eventually have it, right? And that's right. woman's experience. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I tell I tell it to them that way. And I also say, because I, I will tell you, I also took an Uber cab. All right. And of course I went in. This was way early in March. I, I put on my mask and I went in and he, you know, he said, Well, are you afraid of that COVID? And I said, Well, I know it's real, so I'm just gonna protect myself. And of course he starts to explain about him having to work and he have to make money. And I said, I definitely understand that. I said, but think about it this way. I said, it's better if you wear a mask because you may pick up something from another rider who's not wearing it, who may have symptoms or who may just call you to take them to the hospital because they're having symptoms. You pick up the virus, then maybe you're strong enough to get over it. Then you go home, you visit your mom, your mom visits your grandma. And I said, it could go around, it could end up right back into your household. Mm -hmm. So while you're thinking only for yourself in terms of, well, I'm safe or I'm strong or I'm healthy, you know, you could be one of the spreaders and it could end up right back in your household. Mm -hmm. So once I give them that perspective, then they seem to have a change of heart in terms of, okay, you know what, this is really happening and I can be a part of, you know, making decisions that will lessen the effect, right? So if everybody start to have that perspective on it, we'll get more compliance, hopefully and slow the spread of this. So it gives healthcare workers and facilities an opportunity and even researchers to figure out what's going on with it and have the capability or the capacity to manage it when it's happening. When it's happening all at once, like it is here now in New York, everybody gets strained and you know, difficult decisions have to be made, unfortunately, with 
life and death. Kimisha, um, I, I know that there is some, um, some talk around this COVID virus reappearing in more dangerous form in the fall when flu season rolls around. Mm -hmm. Where what are we looking at right now? Where are we looking at flattening? Is there a possibility that we're going to flatten soon? Uh, will this thing still be hanging around us uh, around about the fall? And what's the potential for, for, for fall? I can't answer that question. I'm hoping that it doesn't. Um, I've heard the same um, even in the hospital today talking to a few providers that are saying, you know, they're expecting a, a resurge of this to come back. I, I'm not sure. I can't answer you straight up to say, I can't guarantee you. <laughs> I can't predict what's <laughs> going to happen in September. Yeah. So I don't know. I could only share with you in terms of currently what we were experiencing three weeks ago, it, you know, being the say most of my caseload was a lot of COVID to now even a hospital wide, we have less. That we're seeing for sure, the cases are decreasing. To see a research, I'm hearing these speculations, but I can't answer that question to say mm -hmm. yes or no. Right. Any anyone with any history on this uh, on a topic that that could share? You know, you don't have to give me your opinion, but any history? Well, what is what we've seen with 1918? Mm -hmm. The calculations it went from 1918 to 1920 mm -hmm. when they had mm -hmm. the, the Spanish flu, which really was not mm -hmm. Spanish. It just happens that Spain was the only country not at war, and they were the first ones reporting. So yes. they blamed it. But it all originated in Arkansas, in the United States. And we had a drop off in the summer. And then we had where almost 50 million people died come the winter. That's the pattern that everyone is expecting to repeat itself. And will COVID be the same? Highly, high likelihood. For the simple reason, we have seen multiple mutations now, and the latest uh, research will be coming out this week. Will show where they've found the mutations were happening so fast that there is no way anyone can say it originated in one place in Hubei province in China, because the mutations are so rapid, and they've seen so many around the world that they're saying it was very fast, and it's going to continue mutating. So even if we were to find a treatment today, let's say a vaccine or one of the two medications which they're trying to fast track by Gilead and by the Japanese pharmaceutical companies, that it may not be of any help, maybe a 30%, no better than uh, when you get a vaccine nowadays for the, the regular seasonal flu. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be a cure. It will be something you will have to get it. We give you tr medication now and maybe cut two or three days off your illness from the two weeks of illness that many people are suffering. It but, I, I mean, maybe it doesn't have to work either, right? It doesn't have to work. Uh, the, the only treatments that have worked in terms of these medications happen to be Pavipravir, which is made by a Japanese uh, company. And that medication was made specifically to fight against COVID, SARS-CoV-2. This is SARS-CoV-2. They had SARS-CoV-2 before. He was tested since 2015. Uh, the Japanese military was very heavily involved in, in this testing. And this is the medication that they, we've used in Japan. And they've been given it to everyone that they suspect have it. They have a lower death rate than we doing it. They're so much closer to China and to South Korea, where there were over 200,000 people infected alone in South Korea. Gary, so there's something with the medication. Gary, you had a thought? No, no. Again, I, I was agreeing with him. I, you know, I um, was thinking to myself as well. What, it, what is the basis for this thought that the um, virus is going to be even more uh, sort of deadly in the fall? But I think, um, like um, Dr. Lawson said, that the uh, history of the Spanish flu is what we're sort of banking on. But, but you know, who knows? This virus has behaved differently from everything we've known. So it's very uncertain on what's gonna happen, you know, coming forward. I do know that testing now is, is being increased so much that the numbers are going to start trending up again in terms of positivity. They're, they're just going to, but whether or not uh, people are going to be as sick or sicker, that's still yet to be determined. 
Yes, and I agree, Dr. Clue, that's the thing. It's not that people won't be positive. We will get high numbers of, mm -hmm. of positive testing, but how infective is right. the, the virus and how deadly it will be, maybe it won't be as deadly and, does, and that would be good. The right. problem is in the past, we're relying on numbers that says we are controlling things when we really haven't been testing. You need to test at least 3% of your population. And we're testing for the United States in itself, less than 1%. Right. It, what they, they would lead you to believe, I think, sometimes in the media that we're testing so much more. Yes. And people just looking at the numbers, 100,000 tests were done today. Not what many change. people don't realize, 100,000 tests just means 50,000 persons because each individual has to get a minimum of two tests, one through the nares, one orally. If they're already sick, those people are going to be tested. So at least it will even be less than 50,000 individuals that are tested. So yeah. the, the numbers that they're telling you is not real. Maybe not quite so. And it's not, not exactly what we're thinking. And they hope you go, oh, well, we're testing enough people, but it's not true. And like many states are opening now, it will be three weeks time before we'll actually know the effects of them opening oh, because yeah. infection rate is anywhere from two to 14 days. Mm -hmm. And then oh, so the, afterwards. Yes, so the testing, sorry, yes. the testing, is it because we don't have enough um, equipment when, or human when you resources? Say, what, what, when you say we, are you speaking about the so-called yeah. first world country or you speak? All right, all right. I, when I say we, I'm, think, I'm talking about United States, but I'm really interested in, in Jamaica too, yes. Okay. The United States, first off, remember testing. We developed a test that couldn't tell the difference between water and COVID, and that was in January. It took them three weeks to realize this test was faulty. Then we made a test where we had the test, but we didn't have the reagents. So I have a test mm -hmm. kit where I can take a sample, but now I need the chemical agents mm -hmm. to be able to touch on it and say, when this PCR is done, this is positive or not. So you have one, but you don't have the other. So when the president says, yes, we have lots of testing kits, he left off the part, we don't have the reagents. So it's like having a gun for show, but no bullets. <laughs> it's, it's just of no use. In yeah. Jamaica, a similar thing happened. We got testing kits, the reagents, that's really where the money is. It's like a, a patient who has diabetes, every patient gets you these glucometers free. Yep. They made the money from the strips. But it's the strips. The strips right. that's <laughs> the, the strips and, and, and that's the thing. Mm -hmm. Another thing is, in terms of cost, many people don't realize a, to do a test is about three to $4,000 is the cost. And because there was a um, disagreement between the government and the insurance companies, the government said you could get your test for free. But the insurance comes up, whoa, wait a minute. When you say free, you mean I don't get something out of this. So if I send one of my patients a Blue Cross Blue Shield, for example, then he or she will get it for free, right? And then the companies that are doing the test goes, no, this is costing us $3,000. Somebody has to foot this bill. Mm -hmm. So there's all, the, all these breakdown. You have kits, no reagents, and who's going to pay for it? Mm -hmm. So that was the major problem. In terms of Jamaica, Jamaica had kits then the suppliers that Jamaica decided to go to the U United States government seized several of those um, kits that were being sent to Jamaica because we went on a war footing. So then you had reagents, but not the kits. And that caused a delay in Jamaica's testing. So the numbers that Jamaican government is given is also off because they're not, you can't say you only have X amount of persons infected when you've only tested maybe this amount, mm -hmm. and it's no fault of theirs they couldn't test. What they should have done in the beginning was actually go to non-US suppliers. There's a reason the South Koreans, Hong Kong, Taiwan, uh, China has been able to have tests without any problems because they use non-CDC or FDA approved um, testing companies. And these tests do work. There is a company, for example, in North Carolina, they've been sending 500,000 test kits to China from January, but none of those tests are used in the US because the US would not certify them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But they were proven in China and Italy. We could yeah, have used a source like that. All right, so we have a question from, from the audience. She's, uh, 
um, says, for any member of the panel, do you think everyone should be tested <laughs> for COVID even if they are asymptomatic? No. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm giving someone else the floor. Oh, okay. Who, who wants to take that? No one? <laughs> well, my opinion is uh, it, it's, it's not necessary to test okay. everyone. Uh, However, people who come in, look at Dr. Clooney. He was ill and he was denied that testing. There are people- Is that because, who, it, was ex, is that because it was expensive? No. It sounded like it was, you, you, didn't, you weren't worth that $3,000, uh, Dr. Clooney. I think they were confused in the beginning. Of the <laughs> in the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. Oh but, I, but I do think that um, increased testing will help because you know the whole point of, to me, the whole point of this is, um, you have to test, then you have to trace, and then you have to sort of isolate to try to uh, uh, minimize the spread of the disease. And so testing does need to increase. Uh, whether or not every single person needs to get tested, you know, that, that's another question, but testing definitely needs to be increased. When, when I think yes. about somewhere like, and I haven't been to Jamaica, so maybe in a long time, my ge geography is off. If you go to somewhere like a trench town or any of the places people call in, in the ghetto where people urbanly they're very close mm -hmm. if somebody comes out and says listen i am not feeling well that person shouldn't feel like he or she wouldn't be tested it's that population that needs to be tested you don't test everyone but anyone comes with symptoms or complaints should be afforded the test without any rhyme or reason no hassle for that patient population because once one person hits then you get the pinball effect and right. everyone else that there surrounds them is going to also have um well, well you 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 bring up a, a good point there but um you think about the persecution that one gets when they're identified as having, when uh, yeah right that's and that's one yeah and then and then you all, i wanted to to get back to that lady who died last week you had a, an opinion um on 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 the fear factor of um, of what caused her death, and and I'd like to explore that a little bit. So you can answer both both questions. Okay. Yeah. Well, you know, that's where leadership comes in, especially in Jamaica. Saying, listen, if we catch early, there is there should be no fear. It is when people are going to be passing things on, and what we refer to as sentinel carriers. The sentinel carriers are the ones who are going to infect. It's like the guy who has HIV and he doesn't tell his partner and he passes it along. That's where the danger lies. And that's where leadership has to come in. And I say leadership, I'm talking about the church. I'm talking about our politicians, our physicians, our nurses. When I grew up, my grandma was a principal in, the, in our district in Manchester. And when principal said something, everybody listened. And I think we need to have like an ecumenical meeting on, on this. Get everybody together and say, listen, let's get rid of the hype. Let's get rid of the, the, the conspiracies. Think of the nation. The uptown person is not going to be the one get affected. It's going to be somebody who lives downtown. It's someone who lives in the hood. Those are the people who we need to look out for. And by educating, even though we're wrapped not rappers, what call them, or DJs, or singers, get into music, do what the WHO is doing. They've gone to social media, TikTok, to, to dispel the myths. And these are the things we need to get, get across to our people that say, listen, don't sit there and be sick and pass it on. Because that was what was happening with Ebola. So many people were sick with Ebola, but they were afraid of the stigma. So their families hid them. And eventually they still infected many people. And we, we should try to get around that. Uh, get to that. Get to, before you go, Gary. Get to that fear factor with the pregnant lady. Yes. Uh, the, this, there was a sense of I've watched the news, listened to everything. There's a sense of tunnel vision, even in the hospital. So the hospital administration is so afraid that their other patients were going to get infected. So, like Dr. Clooney says, when he teaches his residents, if you hear hoof prints, don't think zebra. It's a horse. Stay on track, the most logical things. And they miss that completely because even they are fearful. The people uptown, the leaders are themselves fearful. And why is that? 
because our leadership is not teaching that that is that they're I creating more fear than still they're, they're, they're yes. creating fear yes all right yeah. um go ahead Gary. You want yeah to say if i something? might add to that you know that case obviously was was very disturbing especially for from because of the field i'm in but my, my concern when I heard um, or uh, listened to and also read about the case, you know, first of all, there are many different versions of what happened, but um, and then the postmortem and so on. But um, I think that the initial patient presenting to a hospital who has symptoms of whatever, there has to there have to be protocols in place on how to manage this patient, and especially with COVID being the flavor of the day that hospital should have been, any hospital should have been prepared to say, okay, if someone comes in that we suspect have this, we have to isolate them. This is how we manage them. We put on our protective gear and we move from there. But from what it seemed like they had some hesitation for taking care, they wanted to get her out of the hospital. It just, there was something about either their level of education on the disease and how to protect themselves was missing or that it was a, you know, a class issue, but I don't think that was the issue. Um, and then again, you know, there was lots of um, discussion about what actually, you know, led to her demise. And, you know, um, she initially came in for preeclampsia, you know, and preeclampsia can rapidly lead to heart failure eventually because it's a terrible hypertensive disease. And that could lead to her symptoms of shortness of breath and so on and so forth. It may not necessarily be COVID. But my concern, though, as I, I'm going to bring back in, was that they don't have proper protocols in place, it doesn't appear, to manage a patient who comes in with X, and then we look at the five different things that may be going on, and then triage it. And even if, you know, the, the statement of, oh, we couldn't take care of her if she got sicker, you know, I thought to myself, I don't know that hospital, so I went online to look it up, actually, and it's a full-fledged hospital with a maternity unit, with an OR, and so on. <laughs> and I said to myself, even if worse came to worse, take her to the OR, <laughs> intubate her, put her on an anesthesia machine, and then bring her somewhere appropriate. Or you know, it just felt like her care just really got lost. Did I did I understand that instead of um, you know putting her in a in a secure secluded room, they cleared the entire ward of all the patients? That, did you hear that? Yes, sir. <laughs> you know they may have, but again, that's the fear factor and the, the, factor. the sort of the education wasn't there. It education. No yeah. protocols in place. Right. And Leo, as Dr. Clooney says, protocols, but that was the behavior historically we saw during the HIV um, yeah. crisis. Yes, yes. So if there is such a high level of, um, or such a lack of knowledge on the part of the people, and then there's a lack of knowledge on the part of the leaders and the healthcare professionals, what are some of the, how can we address these, how, how can we contribute to the solution? Uh, what you guys are doing here, having us here, that's a start. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I will tell you from my, my side, I've spent years trying to give back to Jamaica. I have had uh, my run-ins where things just didn't happen. I have learned that there's always a pushback for those of us who unfortunately went to the great Satan up north to study instead of staying at the UWI or somewhere else, there is that there is that sense of classism where we do not want to hear from what you guys have to tell us. Mm -hmm. uh, I have no problem not showing anyone up, but when, it come, when I see things like this propagating, and I've seen it happen before in the past, this forum helps us to start. Yeah, yeah. excellent. Kimo, I mean, not Kimo, but Kimisha, did you, did you I, I saw you pop out and pop in. Did you want to share in the conversation? Unmute. Unmute. I got it. No, okay. no, I think it was well said. My phone is dying, so I went to get charger. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, Shannon. <laughs> you you know share? what? I, I do want to share. Um, I think it really starts in smaller groups. Um, for example, um, like if you have the church and you have a leader of a church, be a leader in terms of educating your congregation as to what's going on. And I know there may be some kind of uh, confusion with people of faith, some people of faith who will say, well, I prayed and I'm not gonna get the virus and it's great. We encourage you to continue having your faith. 
right? Especially in a time like this, we also encourage you to make common sense decisions, mm -hmm. right? Know what the facts are, understand the facts. Yes, it's real. Yes, the virus is there. And there are precautions that you can take, right? So, you know, start from, from areas like that, right? So, and whatever small groups that we can have effects on, we should do that because it's educating um, the people so that they understand that it's serious, what the challenges are with it, what the challenges are that we're possibly going to face in the future and how they can make a difference. Because once people start to feel like they can make a difference by the small actions that they do, then there's a higher likelihood that they'll be compliant. And I think if we start there, it will help. So, you know, I mean, I also think that the entertainers have a large part to play and I have listened to a few of them, um, you know, in Jamaica. And yes, there are a lot of them who are supporting. There are a few, however, who are, you know, taking a different route. They have to take some social responsibility mm -hmm. in knowing that there are people who are listening to them and who will put themselves at risk because they're getting misinformation. So those people need to be held accountable in knowing that they're putting information out there that is not correct, that will cause people to make decisions that will put themselves at risk, their family and their neighbors and their communities at risk. Mm -hmm. So they should really educate themselves and then go back and say, listen, this is the fact, right? And pull back whatever misinformation they put out there because this, this is not something that is simple and this is not something that, you know, somebody could just say something that seems to be popular. Oh, it's 5G and you get a lot of likes and you get a lot of views and you feel good about it. But at the cost of who and at the cost of how many lives, how many people, right? So they have to really take some social responsibility and get facts, educate themselves, and then in turn, using the platform that they have, with the thousands of people who are following them and give people the correct information. Do something good for them. At least you could do is give them the correct information. So I, I, I think that those of us who, um, we're Jamaicans mm -hmm. and um, we left Jamaica and we have gained much, not necessarily, I'm not talking about financially because I've still got to do that yet. But anyway, um, we've gained a lot in terms, of, in terms of knowledge and expertise in different areas. And I totally agree, I totally agree with um, Dr. Morgan when she talked about responsibility. So the social media persons need to take responsibility in passing on the correct information. I think that all of us as Jamaicans who have gained so much, we need to find ways to actually use what we have gained to contribute to Jamaica, because I believe that a lot of the, um, the behaviors that we're seeing are related to fear and lack of knowledge on, at all levels, at yeah. all levels. And we cannot be afraid of the pushback that we're going to get. Um, Dr. Loss mentioned that, and that is really true. The, the immediate attitude is, you know, oh yeah, you know, you're American, go back to your whatever, whatever, whatever. We're not Americans. We might be American citizens, but we are Jamaicans by birth. And I believe that it is our responsibility to take everything that we have and find a way to influence our country and our people for the better. So, you know, even while I'm sitting here and I, I like what we're doing, and I think it's um, a good start and it, it's beneficial, I really want to encourage us to think even more, what else can I do? Because it's very easy for us to identify the problems. But we got to go beyond that first step of identifying the problem and try to brainstorm mm -hmm. solutions and actually try to implement them. Because some of them will work. Some of them won't, but some of them will work. So we got to do something. Thank you. OK, so we have just a few minutes before we wrap the show up. And so um, let me uh, say this. I'm going to ask each of you, you know, to spend one minute or 30 seconds, between 30 seconds and one minute for your, last, for your final word on any one of the topics that we talked about tonight. Um, but in the meantime, today is uh, Nurse. the start of um, Nurses Week. The National Nurses, Nurses Week. Week. Nurses yeah, Week. So I want all the nurses out there, uh, Kimisha, Dr. Morgan, Dr. Beverly, uh, I know that you guys are first nurses. I don't know about Gary and Gary, but I don't know those three ladies. <laughs> um, happy nurses, a pretty big, uh, I, I really, um, you know, we saw how nurses stepped out this, year, this time 
in this really unfortunate time and the doctors too, but this is nurses week, not doctors week. And we want to, 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 to salute them, to, to say thank you for the work that you've done. Thank you mm -hmm. for all the, 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 um, the fear that you have stepped across into and across and, and to be able to, 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 to take care of somebody other than yourself. That's a big thing. And so thank you so much for, for, for being a nurse. Thank you for taking the time to go through school and become someone who can offer the kind of care that I saw, uh, that I read about um, Mary Seacole and, and um, uh, Nightingale, uh, what's her name? What's her? Florence Nightingale. Florence. Um, you know, those were big names in our, in our past. And so, you know, kudos to the work that you do. Um, so we'll start with uh, Dr. Uh, Lawson first. Okay. Um, my thing is, as Shannon said, we need to engage our artists, our leaders. I hope you, if any of you remember the Ethiopians in 1969, their Jamaican group, they actually did a song about the Hong Kong flu. Hong Kong and being flu. there to help and educate people so we don't get misinformation. That's Some how we could engage. <laughs> we, my dad made sure he sent me that. <laughs> But my last thing, so anyone listening out there in Jamaica, if you don't have means of getting soap or these detergents, hand washing can be done with Acupods. The Acupods has saponification. It's used to make soap. It's there. So the people who don't have the money to buy the other things can use that. Another thing, if you're making your own mask and you need good filters, use the kaya that is actually in the husk of the coconut and you lay them horizontal longitudinal diagonal, then you put your bandana over it. You've just made a filtered mask right there. You'll capture, even mm. if someone were to spit at you, it's going to, to capture it there. There are all these things we have. It's just there naturally. The Rasta man was not lying when he told you. <laughs> you... Okay. The song goes, some say it's dengue fever. fever. I know it's Hong Kong <laughs> flu. There's an easy death set. You win more than <laughs> Dr. Gary Clooney, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you again for uh, inviting me to participate in this panel. Um, you know, I just want to say, you know, the main, most important thing is to, um, to my fellow Jamaicans out there is to listen to the credible advice and uh, social distance, hand hygiene, use your mask um, and stay at home whenever possible. Um, the other thing I want to say is um, many think that because they're young, healthy, that they're not at risk of any serious uh, effect from this uh, disorder, from this uh, disease, this virus. But I'm here to tell you in the United States, we have plenty of evidence of young folks who mm -hmm. are picking up the virus because they're not heeding the warnings and ending up on ventilators and worse. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just want to um, say that, you know, they talk about having pre-existing conditions and having uh, comorbidities. Those are fancy words that nobody knows what to do with, you know, but just know that if you have an inhaler, if you take a medication on a daily basis, if you see a doctor for any reason, you are very much at risk for effects from this disease, not just the elderly. And um, you need to really take it seriously. And also, um, as my friend was giving a little advice on some uh, home sort of remedies or home ways to, to, to make masks and so on, get those vitamins in, um, get your garlic, get your immune system up, get your garlic in, get your turmeric, which is inside of curry, you know, get your citrus fruits, things like that, almonds, all these things, yogurt, they will help bring your immune system up so you'll be ready to fight this virus if it comes but your way. And you're a living proof. Ah, yes, <laughs> that's exactly right. Sure. Give me shout, Clark. All right, um, just especially working in a hospital and then diabetes, especially in an endocrine, I would say for patients, uh, Dr. Gordon spoke about today about self-care for us as healthcare workers, but I, I wanna empower every person, um, to empower every person to take care of your health, take care of you. It's not just mm -hmm. the politician, it's not just the doctors, the nurses and everybody else. We have a role, we each have a role. We have one body that we're responsible to take care of. Um, be mindful of what we put in it at the same time, increase our vegetables, our greens. I hear Dr. Um, Clooney talks mm -hmm. about, you know, your vitamins and all these things, but 
exercise, lifestyle modification, stop smoking, you know, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. These are some basic fundamental things that we sometimes step away from that can be very nurturing and uplifting for our health and our immune system. So I would say, um, take care of yourself. Um, uh, Shannon? Right, so the panelists have actually, you know, stated things that are, are quite important and I agree with all of them. Um, I just wanted to also say that while we talk about comorbid conditions, um, understand that there are a lot of people who have conditions that they and they don't know that they have it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they may be walking around feeling healthy and feeling fine. And really, if they go to the doctor and get some tests done, you'll find you know, issues that they're not aware of. So I want people to keep that in mind that even though you may be feeling healthy, you, there may be underlying conditions that you have that will cause you to be more susceptible if you become ill with a virus to you know, possibly having it on the worst case scenario. So definitely take your vitamins, keep healthy. This is a chance to really make some different choices in terms of your health. You know, okay, fine, there may be limitations in terms of where you can go because certain areas are being closed down. Try to find something else that can occupy you, right? And, you know, I know there's concerns of food shortages. Like, you know, I also see that there are neighbors helping neighbors. Like, I think it was the St. Thomas who loaded their, their trucks with goods and brought it to Portmore you know, to give it out to the people who were quarantined. So that relieves some kind of anxiety that they have. But I also encourage for those who are living um, in areas that I would call the more rural and more country areas, you know, there's a lot of land there that is not being utilized, right? Because they've gotten so used to the um, fast food world and, you know, things coming quick. This is an opportunity to look at the resources that you have and to maximize it and to use it and to go back to some sort of um, production of foods that you can have for yourself, right? So if you're living in a country, you possibly may not need to run to town to grab certain things. You could get it right there, right? So this is opportunity to look at the resources that you actually have that you can use that you may have been possibly ignoring because you've gotten used to imported goods. <laughs> um, Self-sufficiency. This is an opportunity to, in agriculture to get some more self-sufficiency because the land is there and it's fertile. And just continue taking care of yourselves, not just physically, but mentally also. Know what you're feeding your mind. You know, if you go online, be selective. Be selective because what you put in, just like your body, what you put in your mind is going to affect you. So minimize exposure to things that are causing you stress. If the news is too heavy, and is reporting all these deaths, get the facts of what you need to know, the masks, the vitamins, the home remedies, <laughs> get those, you know, feed your mind with healthy stuff and practice that, it'll, it'll decrease your stress level, right? So that's, that's, that's what I wanted to add, you know, but I think the panelists overall gave a good summary of things that they, you know, that are really important. And thank you Beverly. so much. Thank you, Beverly. Beverly, go ahead and, and, and wrap this up. I have one question for mm -hmm. uh, Gary Larson, but um, go ahead and wrap this up. Because we don't know what the what meaning of core morbid, and we hear it all over the place <laughs> every day. The Prime Minister, they might use it at Jamaica. We don't know what is core morbid. What? Core morbid? Co. C-O. 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 Co yes. OK, what is that? It's just any other illness you have. <laughs> <laughs> Along with. Along with whatever it is that we're focusing on. Okay. Yes. <laughs> All right. Go ahead, everybody. Well, this has been this has been a great discussion, and I'm so grateful to you, the panelists. Um, thank you for having been here and for all that you have shared. I am sure that somebody has benefited from something that has been said tonight. And this is not the end of things. This is the beginning of things. So we will, um, you know, continue to do our part. To, um, to help with this COVID situation and after COVID, because I believe there's gonna be an after COVID. I don't know what it's gonna look like, but it's <laughs> going to be an after COVID. <laughs> and so, you know, we will continue. Thank you so much, everyone. It's been a great pleasure. 
And I'm sure that Gary Loss is going to hear from you and Kimi, Kimi is going to hear from you. They're all going to hear from me again. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, for the persons who are, who are listening online, thank you so much for being here. The Leo Gilling Show will be back Saturday morning uh, at 9 a.m. right here at, on, um, on Jamaicans.com. Thank you, panelists. Have a nice evening. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Bye-bye.